Hey, good morning, folks. Uh, good day, folks. Good morning from Seattle. Howdy, kid. Feels like we should be having some sort of light banter. I'm not. <laughs> I'm trying to think of what what good topic there is. Uh, oh, somebody can bring their pet on camera. That always helps. Their what camera? Their pet on camera. Oh, the pet. Yeah, Dog, that. Cat, <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> I'd grab mine, but I think they're in front of a heating vent right now. Ah. Is it cold where you're at? Well, I'm in Portland, so it's not too bad right now. It's like we're about 10 Celsius, so about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. I see. Does it cats. Right. Yeah. Does anyone have stories to share around um, cybersecurity issues related to Ukraine? I saw from Microsoft our... Um, our president uh, issued a blog post yesterday that mentioned that we had been aware of some new um, attacks against Ukraine and, and we'd updated our software um, uh, to help protect against those. Is, is that a public blog post? Do you have the link by chance? Yeah, I can. Yeah, let me grab that. Thanks. Well, did anyone see anything from Dan or Dan Lawrence or Kim Lewandowski? Usually they would be here to kick us off. Just sent Kim a message on Slack.
Okay, and I, I just sent both of them email as well. So um, I haven't I haven't heard, but it seems like we're seven minutes in, so it'd be good to get started. Um, from our, let me pull up the agenda document. Okay, on the, let's see, so on the agenda, we had just one thing for today, unless anyone else has anything to add, um, and that is to discuss, so Microsoft has been doing some work uh, looking at signing formats for um, supply chain artifacts, things like software bills of materials and other things. Uh, and I wanted to share with you a document that we put together um, internally where we identified uh, a set of requirements and then also evaluated a number of different formats. Um, is there any anything else from anyone else that we want to add to the agenda? Hey, this is a really small thing. I just typed it in the wrong place, but like there's an open SSF shared calendar and this working group meeting is not on it. And I was confused as to why. Uh, so Kim Lewandowski just sent me a Slack that said that today's meeting was canceled. Uh, okay. I didn't see that. So. <laughs> Do, is it, does it show on the calendar for, I don't have the calendar up. Does it show on it for two weeks from today? I will look ahead. That's a good question. Yeah, if, if it, this guy's canceled, all 16 of us did not get that memo. I know. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> well, many of us have created a copy on our own calendars and used that to sort of track it. And so that doesn't, you know, doesn't magically get deleted. Yeah, can't really access uh, Google Docs and stuff easily from within our VPN. So. Okay, um, well, I don't know. We could, we could still go ahead and, and you know, discuss this one item that we had, or we could also wait and do that uh, in the next meeting, which would be two weeks from now. I guess I'd rather go ahead and, and share if, if that works for, unless anyone has concerns with that. The meeting's recorded, so I think it's good to make progress. We've got enough people here. Okay. Michael, did you see is the meeting on the open SSF calendar for two weeks out? It, it is. So it was like somebody canceled it from the open SSF schedule. Those of us who made copies in our calendar still had a thing in our calendar with a Zoom link. Right. So, you know, hmm. um, I, I don't know why it was canceled. Um, it's something to follow up. I think there's not, it's not, Right. Well, not, not not 
Okay. Um, so let me, I'm going to, uh, I'll sort of kick off this, the discussion of, um, you know, what we did in this supply chain envelope comparison. And then um, Ian McMillan um, from Microsoft is also with us, as well as um, uh, Brian Krell, and they really led this work. So I'll let them kind of talk people through the, through the document. The, the background again is that, let me open the link to this. Inside of Microsoft, we are planning with the upcoming um, executive order uh, on improving the, the nation's cybersecurity, executive order 14028. Um, we're planning to publish some uh, artifacts of conformance to executive order requirements. It's actually conformance to the Secure Software Development Framework, SSDF. Um, and that's all information that NIST has published about how companies uh, demonstrate conformance with the executive order requirements. Um, so we'll be providing these attestations. Um, we'll also be, we're also planning to make publicly available our software bills of materials um, for all of our products and services. Um, first, we'll, in terms of sequencing, first we'll be providing the conformance attestations and then a little later we'll be making our our software bills of materials public. That's just, you know, internal, uh, the time it will take us to uh, get those various documents ready for publishing. Um, so as we were evaluating um, how we would be, signed, we want to sign those um, when we make them available. And this document is something that um, just describes our process for um, looking at which signing format we would use. So that's the background that I'll uh, give, and then I'll turn it over, Ian, if you're ready, and, and let you walk us through from there. Yeah, thanks, Kay. Yeah, and as Kay was saying, I, and, and as the document states, I mean, when we look at signatures and what are we trying to get from them, it's really those two main things that we, we know and love about signing. It's authenticity and that integrity promise. Those, those can be used to equate uh, do I trust this or not trust it? And, and, and other security decisions can be made uh, with the signature. So we, we're looking across not just the, the supply chain conformance content, but also the goods perspective, source code, binaries, firmware, digital media, photos, videos, uh, and all the way down to IoT device images to uh, firmware that's running on a chip, a very small chip, or even with inside of a die inside of a chip. So we had to look at our requirements from a number of technical angles that included the OS independence perspective. We, we in this document, we give a brief summation of what we mean by OS dependence. What do we mean by device reach? You know, going, if you simplify that, going from a server class machine all the way down to a, you know, very, very L0 firmware, uh, that little die running inside of a chip uh, type of, of device or, or even smaller IoT devices that have low, low resources. Uh, we also looked at aspects of crypto agility and what we need to be able to account for the good practices that we see out there in the crypto world and, and that we follow around uh, having the ability to, to establish different algorithms that we may want to use uh, based on uh, different findings and different uh, needs out there, going from RSA to ECC, different key lengths, uh, different hashing algorithms and hashing algorithm lengths and whatnot. Uh, then formatting the version, uh, format has to have a version ID. This is really to, to allow verification tools to be able to understand which version of the signature am I working with and be able to not have to re-sign everything just because we came up with a new signature version or modified the existing version to then 
we needed to have unauthenticated and, and authenticated metadata, as well as the really focus on the authentication of, of metadata and the payload. Uh, trust model flexibility. This is really a hot topic of uh, when we bring in OS independence and other independence in, in, in the focus here, you have to have keys to X509 PKI, your traditional kind of X509 public trust PKI, maybe even uh, to open PGP, secure ledgers and, and whatnot. So we really needed to, to look at a signature format that's gonna be able to support that trust model flexibility goals that we have. Uh, signature lifetimes is common thing that we see when we're talking about any kind of signature as it's associated to code or any kind of artifact. Once I sign something, how long is it good for? Do I need to re-sign it? Those kind of different things come in, in there. And we, we wanted to have a, a format that can support signature lifetimes. Other things here like air gap network. Uh, if you look at the way we, one might look at traditional PKI, you're thinking, oh, I need to have online connectivity for Krills and OCSP. Uh, we needed to have flexibility there, not just be something that requires an, an online connection to be able to get uh, status. Uh, detached and embedded signatures. We want to be able to embed something into the artifact itself, a signature, or be able to have it detached and ship it separately. Uh, all these other ones are kind of self-explanatory, especially when we get into multiple endorsers uh, to then what we call trust resilient signatures or multiple hybrid signatures where I can actually sign an artifact at the time of signing with multiple uh, keys and have a path to alternate chains of trust in case one is compromised or one is no longer trusted. Uh, then from an ecosystem perspective, we really focused on industry standard, having something that our uh, consumers out there would, would widely feel comfortable with adopting, uh, especially if it's a standard, it's easier for all of us to, to work on it cohesively together and not have forks of one going this way, one going that way. We can stay together uh, and work together to, to make something that is gonna meet all of our customer and consumer needs. The, Ecosystem support was really big. We didn't want to just have a signature format that is only supported by this, this uh, small ecosystem, let's say by on Windows uh, to uh, you know, something that I couldn't really parse or, or understand it. There's no ecosystem support on say Linux, for instance. Multi-laying library speaks to that as well. Uh, it's Again, getting to that device reach and that OS platform independence perspective. The minimize library errors part is really about making sure that the signing format isn't overly complex nor overly simplified to the point where a lot of errors can occur. And that's where vulnerabilities and, and exploitation of those vulnerabilities can, can come into focus. And that also goes into minimizing developer error. So uh, we dove into primarily, I would say, four uh, signing formats that we looked at. We looked at uh, Cbor Cozy, or I should just say Cozy, because the C in Cozy stands for Cbor. Uh, dead simple signing envelope, Dizzy. Uh, the then the ever so popular JWS, JWT, and all of its variants, as well as PKCS7. And really, as we went through this, what you'll see in the document is we outline, you know, what is CBOR or what is COSI? How do we view it in terms of measuring against 
those requirements that we detailed out? What are what? How does it stand? What are the what is our perspective on on how it can or cannot meet those requirements? And you know, with Cozy, we found a lot of value in in its ability to meet a lot of these. Uh, and it was by far, it, it really came out as the one that kind of shined for us that, that we would like to, to look at leveraging across all of those, those uh, artifact types and all of the different scenarios. Uh, we also looked deeply at Dizzy and um, we should probably mention that, I mean, there, there were concerns about COSY as well. Oh, um, yeah. It is still, um, it's still relatively new and, you know, there are, there are some libraries for it, but in terms of ecosystem, it's a, I would call it a, a developing e ecosystem, certainly not, not as strong as um, the, um, the JWS, JWT or the PKCS7 communities. Um, we also had some questions about um, minimizing these area these requirements in terms of minimizing library error and then also developer error. And so on the minimizing library error, um, we have been involved with a few folks from the the Cozy community, in particular, um, some people from the from the company Arm who have implemented a, um, they've implemented a Go version of the Cozy library. At Microsoft, we've been implemented a .NET version and there's also a, um, there's a Python version. Um, but there is now between Microsoft and the ARM community, we've started a project that um, we call Glue Cozy. And I can open that. Yeah, and Kate, to your point, I mean, we found challenges with all the formats that we looked at <laughs> in meeting these. There's there's some challenges it, it sprinkled throughout. All of them had some level of challenge. It was which one would work the best. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so there's there's this community that's just getting started that um, is setting up a shared test suites that library developers um, can run those test suites against their, li their libraries. And then reports can be put out um, indicating, um, you know, their conformance to various features of the libraries and that um, information about the libraries and the features supported will be available on that um, Glucosy website. Um, the other place where there were concerns is about the complexity of the specification, specifically relative to um, COSY, which is a very simple specification. Um, and um, so for that, there's a proposal, um, which is to use a subset of the, what we call a profile uh, or subset of the COSY specification. And um, it's, it's not going directly to that. Um, anyway, so we've we've proposed a a profile that limits the features of Cozy that would be used for um, signing supply chain artifacts. So just a couple of details about Cozy. Um, anyway, go go on. Yeah. yeah and okay, it's the the. Com the concerns around the large complexity was when we measured against something say like Dizzy, which is very simplistic, uh, very simple and not as complex. And that, that's a design feature of Dizzy that we recognize. So with, um, and, and Brian, feel free to jump into, or, or Steve, you all were a part of this too, in <laughs> looking at this. So feel free to jump in at, at any point here and add any color commentary? Yeah, the only thing that I would add quickly is, I mean, I think that there's sort of been an interesting evolution of this document from sort of an internal uh, discussions to getting some feedback from, uh, we, we talked to Santiago uh, at, at Purdue, who's uh, behind the, the 
tough and in toto. Um, also see some comments in the, the doc from, from Dan Lawrence specifically around um, the, the Dizzy. I, I think that there's, uh, as Ian mentioned, there, there's definitely, it, it is a design goal, it is a feature of Dizzy to be very simple um, in our initial analysis of, um, or comparison of some of these, these formats. Uh, probably evaluated it unfairly in, uh, in, in that respect because it was intentionally not considering the fact that Dizzy is intended to be used, for example, in Tuff or in Toto, where a lot of some of the security guarantees that we were expecting an envelope to be capable of handling are handled in that trust model. Um, and so, you know, I think that is one of the gaps because we did identify that, that trust model flexibility is important for us and we have concerns around Dizzy um, because it does sort of tie to, to those models that, that that include those features and it doesn't have the capability of, of carrying some of that information within the signature envelope. Um, but again, just as people have a chance to read this and review it, I think it's important to keep the context of that evolution in mind. Um, and we're happy to add additional, you know, uh, feedback or con context that people want to make sure we have a fair comparison in this document. I mean, I think the, you guys covered it. It's the, the overly simple because some things were delegated into other areas where the breadth of scenarios where we see we need to support signature formats need something more robust, but it doesn't need to be as large as the COSI spec, such as the glue. So the glue COSI spec reduces that down to a reasonable uh, scope. I think that's the balance that we're shooting for. That's right. That's right. And, you know, as we looked at, you know, moving past Dizzy, as we looked at JSON web signatures, and it, we did find a lot of value in JWS JSON serialization and meeting some of those, those uh, goals that we had here. And JWT overall is widely used, but maybe the JSON serialization not so widely used. And while like Notary V2 is starting to leverage uh, JWS JSON serialization, we, we definitely were, were looking at can, can JWS JSON serialization also work for us or is COSI a better thing or is Dizzy a better thing here? So it, it was a delicate balance of looking at all of these requirements and saying, which one's most important or where they stack rank as well <laughs> to us. And that, like Brian was mentioning, that trust model flexibility really becomes important as we expand out beyond just the uh, supply chain artifacts or with inside of tough and in total models or uh, similar models to that. And how do we look at uh, the digital media portion too here that we're also trying to create uh, a world that doesn't have multiple signature formats across a lot of artifacts that we similarly send. And just a note on the notary stuff, the, the JWT was a placeholder. We, we knew from the beginning we needed to change it. We were originally thinking PKCS7, but there was some gap in libraries. So JWT was used as a placeholder until we can get um, what we thought PKCS7 was going to fill, but the COSI worked really seems to fill it much better. So that's, it's, it's more of a, a, a logical switch to it as opposed to a change in direction. Yeah. And then with, with PKCS7, I, yes, Windows Authenticode uses it heavily. So our familiarity with it was really high, but in general, we felt uh, across OSs, it, it's, it is there, but, it is very complex. Yes, it is battle tested. Have we, has there been implementations that simplified it and, and made it uh, capable of hitting the device reach goals? Yes, but you know, there's, there would be a lot of additional work that we would need to be doing, we felt on PKCS7 to make it work in all these other areas that really, didn't necessarily make sense to us. Um, so like Steve was mentioning, okay, we were looking at PKCS7. 
but I'd like to get questions, comments from anybody here. What's their, what's your perspectives? What are your thoughts on this, on these uh, signing formats? It might be worth mentioning, you know, as one next step. So in our conversations with, um, um, with Santiago, he was suggesting that perhaps we could consider, and you know, this is something that we're talking about on the micro side, side is adding optional support for COSY to the Intoto Golang library. And then that way, um, you know, people who are interested in the COSY format could choose that. And, but, and, and Dizzy of course would, would still be the default, but, but, then there could be, you know, options and people could select. So some, that's something we're we're definitely evaluating. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Kay. Thoughts or questions from others? How many people are familiar with Cozy? or any of the other ones that, uh, any of the formats here that we talked about. I am researching Cozy. This is the first time I've heard of it today. I'm excited to learn more about it. Awesome. Yeah, it was one of those things when, when specifically Brian and I encountered it, we were like, wait, wow, this is pretty impressive. But it definitely, it, it piques your interest as you start to dig further. What can this do? What's interesting is you, you brought up one aspect was that the uh, the multi the multi trust chains or the multi uh, yeah multi chain trust um, being able to be trusted among different ecosystems that was uh, I've never thought about that I don't know why but until you mentioned that today that's um, that was cool yeah and that that alternate chain of trust aspects we start to think about how how else can that evolve with even the concepts of of um, how do we think about like quorum when we talk about quorum is does this does this cluster meet quorum do i have enough servers here enough people here to meet quorum well, what about signatures uh, and trust anchors for for some critical pieces of of content that that may be necessary well you talked about one thing I was, um, as you're saying, one thing I've been thinking about is like the probability of trust. I think about like sort of the concept behind search search engine results. You have this this um, this authority rating, right? This is almost like a trust rating where you're going as if it's in different chains of trust, or if like Microsoft says, "Yes, I trust this," and it's out here, and so you have other big companies saying they trust it, and you know, and it can validate it. It almost gives this this type of rating, this community rating, to the trustworthiness of this of, of this artifact. Um, yeah. That's true almost like social proof, but social proof applied that was the, this is uh, the, um, the concept of social proof applied to, you know, publicly open our uh, open source software. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Almost like a new little community badge for maintainers. Like, Hey, I've got trust of X, Y, and Z. You can see it here. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Thank you for sharing. Oh yeah, thanks. Thank you, Jim, for the, the feedback too. Well, William, right? Oh, I'm sorry, William. <laughs> right. No problem. Okay. Well, if no other questions or comments on that, that was the only item that we had on the agenda. Um, we'll try to figure out, um, I can you know, reach out to Dan and Kim and um, Jennifer from the, I guess Jennifer from the Linux Foundation was the one who actually canceled the meeting, um, but I'll try to figure out why not everyone saw that it was canceled. Um, yeah. Maybe there was a snafu in the mailing list or something else too. Okay. Um, I think, you know, you guys asked for questions. I don't feel like th there was a sufficiently broad set of people here to be able to 
actually ask all the questions you wanted. So I, I feel like we're going to want to do this again um, with the broader group. I, I, I should have said that up front. I wasn't clear, but, you know. Uh, Dr. Michael, we, it's just while we were, there was enough people here, I thought it was just good to get something out and people can view the recording. I, I don't see this as a one review and done kind of thing. I, yeah. yeah, this has been an iterative process. Sounds good. Yeah, that makes sense, Michael. Thank, thanks for mentioning. No problem. What is the expected um, output uh, that we would choose one to make a recommendation for signing formats going forward? Yeah. Uh, that's my hopes and dreams is that we can agree on a, a single format or even a way that how do we converge on formats that are out there that are already being used. I think there's also a, a goal if, if Ian talked about hopes and dreams of everybody agree, yet we're all going forward in the same direction. It may not be entirely realistic, but getting some momentum behind it, leveraging the, the community to, you know, contribute to the, the cozy profile. Some of these efforts like Kay talked about the, um, the glue cozy is sort of a shared um, uh, way forward, leveraging feedback from a lot of different, uh, you know, potential stakeholders. I, I think getting some community support behind it would be, would be excellent. I mean, it, it is a pretty big recognition that, I mean, this is obviously, a, a, and it's been a change happening for a long time in Microsoft. I mean, it used to be, what do we ha, what do we ship on the Windows platform? But the Windows is now a target, not the target. So we, we do recognize that our customers are running on multiple operating systems, are running in multiple clouds, they're running on-prem. I mean, there is no clear line for people. So we the fewer things that tooling has to enable to enable customers to work across things fluidly uh, in, but it has to range, you know, it has to span that range of devices and uh, ecosystems. So I, I think there's a lot of benefit in trying to at least get down to as few as possible, um, but th they do need to have enough robustness to handle um, the outlines in here from small devices to air gap environments to, um, cross government agencies kind of things. I'm sorry, Jim, were you starting to say something? No, I, I had forgotten to take myself off of mute. Though now that I'm unmuted again, um, I'm curious whether the something like this would result in government agencies only accepting a single format um, in the end, because that's what the tooling they have is, or uh, or because of this uh, this group's recommendations, is that a possibility? It removes flexibility for implementers going forward. I think it's a good question. I, I don't, you know, it's hard to know what how these things go. I mean, the governments are not there to create. They're more of like endorsing what they see is, has been a best practice for things and identifying their scenarios. So I think it's, I, I'm sure we've already seen this, like the government is a customer. I mean, let's be clear, right? It's a pretty big customer. Um, it's a pretty impactful customer, but it's, we get this from all of our customers have certain standards that they require. Um, as they see better standards evolve, they shift theirs to that. So we're, this is why I think we are seeing the team focus on something like Cozy, which has an evolving footprint. It's it's growing. It's accounted for the complexity of scenarios. Um, so that, that's that's how this group at least came to that uh, direction. Yeah, we're starting to take a good hard look um, at Cozy now. Obviously, through the Notary V2 conversations um, in AWS. So it's super interesting. Yeah, I think we're you know, maybe we're in the kind of the early socialization. Um, you know, let's and and hopeful that you know we can have a conversation and then you know together, ideally, like others said, they agree on something common that that we would all want to use. We'll we'll see how that goes. First first steps of a conversation. Okay, well, the conversation definitely want to have a conversation. 
and to hear all these perspectives. So I think one of the conversations I would like to have over time, I, I don't pretend for a second to be a crypto guy and all the permutations, it's all great, right? Knock yourselves out, have a great time. So what is the next part, right? Like if we agree on this, what happens next? And how do we start incorporating this into the various solutions that are being built across the space, right? Because it's not gonna be, you know, whatever you guys are building internally suddenly becoming the thing everywhere, right? And so what are the moving parts? How do we fit this in? How does it become an ecosystem integrated solution? Because, you know, I think many of us share the same point of view, which is I don't care about this. I don't want to care about this and I shouldn't care about this, but we seem stuck on it really hard, great. How do we get past it? And how does it actually play out over time? And so this doc is great, but it's really for the people who are going to be arguing about the minutiae of this format or that format from us, either a heels dug in position or a crypto opinion opinion position, neither of which describes me, right? And neither of which describes anybody who's sitting there as a job who is to say, how do I make my systems more secure? How do I not look like an idiot? How do I comply with various EOs, right? This doesn't solve that problem either though. And so we got to connect those dots. And that's what this group should be talking about and figuring out. Uh, I would I would like to see that conversation playing out as well. So uh, I, and again, I'm just being very direct in terms of like what I think needs to happen next in order for us to be able to understand like how do we as a community be able to say, <clears throat> I built a build system or I am building my software in a way that can comply with various expectations, right? And I'm not even being specific about EO or just my own internal security expectations. I have risk here. I want to reduce risk. I want to be able to show that I can match the SSDF uh, expectations by doing this, right? I could paint cozy over every single line of code I've got and it doesn't do a damn thing for that thing directly. There's work to get between there and there. Yeah, I think over. I think that kind of follows on Maybe with, with Santiago's suggestion, Michael, let's see if you think so, where he said, you know, well, why don't, why don't you guys, as a step, why don't you guys, you know, go add cozy support to the Intoto Golang library? Um, and I, I think that's, I think that's great. I mean, I agree. I, I would love to see where are the impedance mismatches, you know, because there was a conversation which I understand conceptually, but don't have the specifics around the different trust uh, sort of expectations of different layers of the of the frameworks. Great. Well, what happens when you collide Cozy with Intoto and what the expectations are around who has to do trusting what or whatever? Those are hard questions to resolve. Let's actually dig in and do it for reals uh, and understand. Totally agree. OK. Well, great. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Apologies. We'll, we'll, sounds like we'll probably do this again in, in two weeks from now. So, um, but we, we definitely appreciate the feedback in the comments today. Okay. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Bye. See you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.